Hi, I'm Tom Crisp, professor in the philosophy department here at Biola and associate director of Biola's Center for Christian Thought. And I'm delighted to have with me today uh, Professor Tim O'Connor, professor of philosophy at Indiana University. And uh, Tim has agreed to spend some time uh, uh, talking with us about uh, the soul, uh, about free will, and uh, we thought too we might talk a bit about some questions uh, having to do with evil and the problem of evil. So Tim, thanks for being with us. Great, thanks for having me. Well, let me start uh, with some questions about free will. Um, there has uh, been uh, some recent work in neuroscience and in social psychology which many scientists have interpreted as making trouble for traditional belief in free will. And so I wondered if you could tell us a bit about some of this research, both the neuroscientific research and the uh, social psychological research, and um, tell us your thoughts about it. What does it show? There's a lot of really fascinating work uh, going on in, in, in both, as you say, neuroscience and social psychology. You can think of it as um, trying to get under the hood of how our, our, our brains work and uh, in help shaping our behavior. Uh, and people, of course, have known for centuries um, that uh, the, the activity of our brains uh, is relevant to how we choose and decide. Every, people have known that if you get hit over the head with a hard, heavy object, um, that's probably going to affect your subsequent behavior, may, yes. maybe cause you to become unconscious or worse. Uh, beginning in the early 80s, a uh, scientist by the name of Benjamin Libet uh, devised a series of interesting studies that people thought had a very surprising, shocking implication. Uh, the studies are very simple. You're, you're asked to sit in a room and um, to, to perform a simple behavior. So you, you, you already decide ahead of time what your behavior is going to be. Maybe just lift your right index finger um, and wiggle it. And you're asked to do this within a 20 to 30 second interval of time, but crucially, you're not to plan ahead of time exactly when you're going to do it. The, the goal is for you to spontaneously decide right, when, when you shall wiggle your finger. And while you're waiting uh, for the, the impulse to do this, you're watching a clock fixed on a wall that's not an ordinary clock. It has a very fast moving dial that goes a few times per second. <clears throat> and you're asked to uh, notice the, the first moment at which you felt the impulse to, to go ahead and wiggle your finger and to notice where the dial on that clock was at that moment. Uh, and of course, um, observation of the clock, uh, light signals, all that takes a bit of time. Scientists know how to adjust for that, right? To try to zero in on when you felt was the actual moment at which uh, you felt this urge to wiggle your behavior. And then the surprising thing was that for almost a half second prior to your, the time you said you felt the impulse, there was a steady buildup of electrical activity in the cerebral cortex um, that they call the readiness potential uh, that some scientists interpreted it as the brain preparing f to trigger the relevant behavior. Okay. And so the interpretation that Benjamin Libet put on this was that your brain had decided before you consciously mm -hmm. had decided uh, uh, to, to go ahead and move your finger. Um, and so what you, your, your sense of impulse was actually a product of an unconscious subpersonal physical uh, decision event. Um, and so it, it, if, if that's the correct interpretation and crucially if Benjamin, uh, the, the Libet type experiment um, generalizes to the kind of decision making we make naturally out, outside of experimental context, then the implication would be that we are deceived when we think we autonomously, consciously decide when to act. It's somehow encoded in unconscious brain processes. So the idea is that the um, free decisions, or apparently free decisions, then are actually being caused by brain processes that happen before we're ever consciously aware of having decided anything. Right. Uh, and my take on that um, uh, is uh, that I don't think these experiments show what Libet suggested that they show. I, I think we need to pay attention to certain things about uh, the, the experiments themselves to begin with. First is that the behavior that you're going to perform is something you have already decided before the, the, the experiment is run. You, you, you've been told 
we want you to decide to wiggle your finger. And that's not typical. Usually when we think of moral choices we make, we haven't pre-decided what it is we're going to do, and uh, it's only up to us what the time at which we shall act. No, we, <coughs> we typically um, are, have, have yet to decide what it is exactly we're, we're going to do. So that's one way in which it's atypical of ordinary decision making. Secondly, another way it's atypical is that I'm being asked if I'm the subject in the experiment to sort of kind of monitor what's going on in my mind subjectively. I'm, 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 I'm asked to, to, to uh, discern an impulse or urge or wish to move. And so that invites me to take almost a, um, a passive role, a, a, an observer role upon myself. Um, and, uh, and that, of course, is not what we're usually doing. We're usually, our attention is directed outward at our behavior, at what, what our goals are out in the world. And that might be relevant in that um, what, what could well be happening in the Libet experiment is that we are just passively waiting for some subjective sort of experience phenomena to occur. And it might well be that our prior decision to participate in the experiment slowly evolves into a, uh, unconsciously, into a building desire or anticipation that I'm about to do this. Uh, and um, it, but, it, but it might not be a prototype of the kinds of choices that we ordinarily make. Um, a third uh, thing to observe about the experiment is that this so-called readiness potential is just a very generalized buildup of activity. There's no evidence to think that it is um, specifically directed at the behavior that we're about to perform and if left unchecked that it would inevitably usher in the resulting behavior. Um, it, I think there is evidence to suggest that there, there's buildup of readiness potential in lots of uh, um, circumstances where no behavior uh, issues forth. So it's not a sufficient condition on our making the choice. So to my, my way of reading the experiment, all it suggests is that um, there's a lot of activity going on in our brain. Uh, even when we spontaneously decide something, Executing actual behavior requires the marshalling of certain forces, the, the triggering of the motor cortex, and um, there's preparatory activity when we anticipate we're about to perform an action. But that's not surprising. It's not somehow suggesting that we, we um, lack autonomy when it comes to the, the choices that we, we eventually make. And might it be that the preparatory activity is, is uh, um, perhaps a desire, something like, I think I'm about, I'm wanting to move my hand pretty quickly here, or an urge, I'm having the urge to move my hand, which is then followed by a, a decision or an intention, and so what's being, what we're seeing is this urge or desire. Yes, actually, I, um, it might well be, and in fact, I think that's a very natural interpretation. Um, and, w uh, and this might be true often in when we're deliberating and we know we need to make an impending decision, there might be a slow, um, you know, first unconsciously and then we become aware, okay, I think this is how I'm going to decide. I'll go for the chocolate ice cream rather than the vanilla ice cream. I, I've got to make a decision here. Um, so yes, it, it might well be that, uh, and, but that doesn't suggest that um, the choice itself uh, was sort of um, already in the cards. It just means that uh, we're, we have having a building inclination towards um, making a choice, um, and so that perhaps our choices are not utterly spontaneous in the sense of just just being in neutral and then decision. Yeah. They're, they're, and, and, and that's not reflectively, just from a sort of common sense point of view, reflecting on our own choices and just different types of scenarios in which we make choices, that's not terribly surprising that that should be so. Right. Yeah, so one way you can imagine it going is it, it could happen. I'm having an urge to raise my hand, I am desiring to, but then I decide not to. So, yes. So might it be that you get the readiness potential, the urge to do something, but you don't do it? You, uh, you yes, it. and in fact, Libet himself, um, who was quite disturbed by um, the, the, the results of his experiment, he uh, went on to do subsequent uh, experiments where he told people, uh, just as before, to look for that urge to, um, to decide to move your finger and then suppress it and then don't actually, it's a very, it's a very, that's a kind of complicated, uh, if you think about it, um, behavior 
to execute, and some people reported not being able to do it, but because you're supposed to decide to do it and then cut off your decision before you actually do it. That's a kind of jujitsu on, on yourself sort of uh, thing. But some people reported being able to do this, and in fact, that's exactly the result they got. They got this buildup of a readiness potential, and then it tapered back down. Now, uh, it's my understanding that since the original Libet experiments in the 80s, there have been some follow-up experiments that have been done in more sophisticated ways. Uh, can you talk at all about some of the follow-up experiments, and do they show us anything different? Um, yeah, so there's uh, Patrick Agard, a, a neuroscientist in London, um, Hakwan Lau, uh, a psychologist, uh, neuroscientist at Columbia University, uh, have both done a number of successor studies, as have a variety of other scientists. Um, these are refinements on the original methodology, um, and uh, I think in some cases they have um, asked people to make a choice whether to move not just your right finger, but among, uh, but also to spontaneously decide whether to move the left or the right fig finger. So now there's a little more, now the, the, the specific action is not entirely pre-planned. Um, and they did find a buildup of readiness potential in this kind of scenario as well. But I think some of the, the same responses we've already discussed apply to these. So, so I, 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 I don't think the, the fundamental criticism of the, the interpretation, the no free will interpretation of the experiments um, apply in these scenarios as well. Um, and I should note there, there have been some recent studies that have, in, have gotten somewhat different results from Libet himself. So I, I gather it's still a little bit controversial just how well established um, uh, uh, some of this, some of his just purely empirical, uninterpreted empirical findings are. You've done uh, quite a bit of writing on the nature of the human person and how to think about uh, what we, human persons are uh, from a philosophical as well as a theological perspective. Uh, so I wondered if you could tell us a bit about your view, or, or emergent uh, individuals, uh, uh, is your ideas that what we are as emergent individuals, and perhaps you could tell us both a bit about the view and, and then how you think it uh, connects up with questions about uh, traditional Christian belief in the afterlife, uh, the intermediate state, um, uh, the resurrection, um, and so forth. Right. Uh, so I should start off by saying that um, uh, I and probably most philosophers, theologians, would say um, we have tentative views about exactly what the nature of uh, the human person is, how, how to understand traditional language of the soul, uh, and how that connects up with our clearly deeply embedded, uh, embodied nature. Uh, there, you, there are different views, and as you say, I've, I've tried to articulate one sort of view that's a somewhat non-traditional view. Um, I'm not at all certain that it's correct, um, but so the, what the traditional view that is embedded, um, there's good evidence from anthropology just in human thought generally, let alone specifically religious thought, is that human persons fundamentally um, are non-physical souls or, or just centers of consciousness. Immaterial um, minds or souls. Exactly. Uh, that in some way uh, are bound up with bodies. This, this seems to be a deeply embedded intuitive human belief. Uh, and it's certainly uh, embedded in much traditional Christian thought. And one can understand why. It, it makes it much easier to understand uh, how we might survive death. And it can fit very um, well with uh, different ways we might conceive of the general resurrection long after we've died and our bodies have decayed. Um, I'm, part of my hesitation for embracing that view, I think there are, there are some significant philosophical reasons that motivate this view, um, I, which I won't go into here, but uh, I do think uh, empirically that we, we, what we've come to learn about ourselves is uh, both uh, in terms of our embeddedness in the history of biological life and the and de slow development of biological life over time, and also just uh, within an individual organism, our, 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 our uh, biological development from uh, embryonic to fully mature human beings is a slow, gradual process. And the reason I see this as at least posing a challenge for the traditional conception of the soul as a distinct thing 
is that the soul uh, on this traditional view is, it has no parts. It's a simple center of conscious awareness and capa psychological capacities of willing and desiring and thinking and so on. And um, so it seems like if, so if the soul is present from our earliest moments uh, in an embryonic state, then it must, the capacities it has, that this, the psychological capacities have, it has must be the same as the, the, the same basic capacities we have now as fully mature human beings. So uh, with a bit of study, we can learn to do calculus, right? We have the capacity to, to engage in very abstract, rigorous mathematical thought. And um, this is, a, uh, on the soul view, that capacity, it seems, would had to have resided even in the embryonic life, the, the soul of the, the, the individual embryo, um, because there's no, at least I, it's not clear to me that we can tell a story about how psychological capacities develop if, it, um, uh, if, if there are no parts in development, biological development. But, but we, so we know biologically a, a lot about the development of organisms and the human organism. And it seems a more natural interpretation is to suppose that as our neural structure develops, our brain and central nervous system develops and matures, uh, that are, we, we, we come to have more sophisticated cognitive capacities. Uh, and uh, so that view, it seems to me, fits better with the thought that what we are fundamentally are biological organisms that have certain capacities that don't reduce to mere biology, psychological capacities of again, of willing and of thinking and, and desiring. Um, we, ha we have states, we, we have a point of view on the world um, that is a, a subjective kind of state that I don't think can be identified with a neurophysiological state. So, so I do embrace a kind of dualism, a, a, a dualism of, of psychological states or capacities, but I see those ca states and capacities as residing within a living, breathing, uh, organism, uh, or most directly associated, of course, with um, parts of our brain. So as, a, as opposed to the dualistic view, according to which we have two parts, an immaterial part and a material part, our body, which are joined together in some way, when we die, the immaterial part separates and, and has some kind of intermediate state and is later joined up in resurrection with the body. On your view, uh, there aren't these two parts. We are material organisms and we have features or characteristics that uh, can't be explained in terms of the underlying, or can't be wholly explained in terms of the underlying physics, but we're just material organisms. Right, and uh, so those, these capacities that we have that don't reduce to merely physical, biological capacities, these psychological capacities we have, are nonetheless on, on the picture I'm entertaining, wholly sustained by, uh, it requires a, a, an intact functioning brain and nervous system um, that's fed nutrients and oxygen you know, uh, and so on, all the precursors of biological life, all of this is necessary for those capacities to persist as they do throughout our lives. But at death, of course, um, the, the, the physical processes break down, our bodies uh, slowly decay. Uh, in the typical case, or very rapidly uh, in certain unfortunate cases, um, but our bodies break down. And so then those, it would seem those capacities simply cease to be. So um, the worry is going to be that some Christians will raise is, well, what about an intermediate state? What about dying and being with Christ? And what about yes. uh, um, an eventual resurrection? And so how does your view think, think about those things? Yes, so the worry would be at death, we cease to be. If, if, what, if what defines us fundamentally are those capacities and they cease to be, and the brain disintegrates, then we cease to be. And um, how, how could there be an intermediate state? And you might even worry, how could we even come to be at a later time? Um, you might think, well, what God does is regather um, the fundamental particles that composed my body at the time of my death and reanimates them. This was uh, a popular way of thinking about the resurrection. But uh, the problem is the, it's unclear that that would be me. Uh, of course, for, for multiple reasons, one of which is parts of me might eventually enter the biosphere and become parts of other human beings. And so then we'd have people vying for control over these, uh, these cells, who gets to have them. Uh, but another more fundamental worry um, is that the, the, this picture of ourselves as a special kind of biological organism 
suggests that uh, material physical continuity is essential to our nature. And simply regathering parts in the form that they once were, it's not clear that that is going to be me as opposed to another individual who's made to be like me. And a, a way to bring this out is um, science tells us that our bodies are constantly taking on and, and shedding parts. And uh, there's now even reason to think that that's true even of our brain cells. Uh, so perhaps uh, the parts that composed me on my 10th birthday, none of those parts are now part of my body now, or maybe very, very few. Um, suppose that, uh, and so those parts have, have entered the biosphere. Suppose God were to, as he could, regather those parts right now and uh, put them in the, the exact form of my, uh, my body and my state at some moment in my, on my 10th birthday and plop that individual down right next to me. A human version of the ship of Theseus puzzle. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I would say that's not me. That's, that's someone, that would be a quite startling state of affairs. It would be as if I were looking at my younger self, but that would not be me. I'm me. I'm, I am the continuation of that individual who was once 10 and is now much older. Uh, th but that's, and we can't both be me since I'm not him, yeah. right? We're not identical to each other. And so it seems like we go with the individual who is a continuation of the, individ, uh, of the original individual, not someone who just happened to have had the parts recycled and reanimated. And so then if you apply this to the resurrection scenario, the worry would be, well, that's just God creating a, an individual, recycling old parts that once were part of me to create an individual a lot like me. But of course I care. Christian hope is that I myself will um, persist in the afterlife. Uh, so, okay, so, so, so I'm, I'm trying to emphasize the difficulty. Right for my view of how to make sense out of survival of death. One scenario uh, that was uh, proposed uh, um, about a dozen years ago by uh, philosopher Dean Zimmerman that, that I like and I think can be adapted to my view is to, is to suppose uh, that, um, well, let me, let me set it up this way. This is a, think of this as a kind of science fiction-y story. What we're after here is an attempt to show that it's at least possible there's some way in which I could survive death consistent with all the observable facts, okay? Uh, now this scenario will sound very strange, uh, but um, so how, how we actually survive death, if anything like my view is correct, um, I'm, I, I don't really know. Um, God uh, probably has more imaginative possibilities than I can contemplate. Uh, but here's one possibility where we could at least see a conceivable um, way it could go. All right, so suppose that just as you are about to die, um, whether of disease or because you are unfortunately situated with respect to a very large bus uh, that is right in front of you, um, suppose that at just that moment, the cells of your body fission, right? Like, like amoebas fission, right? So each individual fundamental particle of your body fissions into two duplicate sets, okay? One product of that fission is just your body right where, where your body was prior to the fissioning. And the other set, God, miraculously, um, causes to appear in a different space, safely right. out of harm's way. Some other okay? region of space time, some other or disconnected region. space yes. time somewhere. Right, wherever, wherever the, the, uh, the intermediate um, life uh, might occur. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's the case, then I would say there's reason to say that that, that um, product, that safely preserved product, would be me, right? Uh, the, the, the body that, that subsequently dies, it too, it, it, it might be the, the, the very stuff of which I had been created. It is the dead body, the remains of me, but I continue to exist in an embodied state um, somewhere else. That and, the, and so then the question is going to be, well, of these two um, uh, results of the uh, fission, why do you go with the living one instead of the one that, uh, that bought it uh, when yeah. they got hit by the bus? Right. Uh, well, I think the reason to say that is that what, de what, is, what defines me as me as a not m merely a material hunk of, of matter that's recycling parts, but as, as, a, as a human person, uh, are my capacities, uh, psychological capacities, moral capacities, spirit, human spiritual capacities, capacity for awareness of God. That's what defines me as a human being made in God's image. 
And those capacities are preserved and c in a continuous way in the, the, the body that survives. And so it seems like that's the continuation of my, my life, my full-blooded life as a, a living, thinking uh, human individual, whereas the, the now dead uh, hunk of matter uh, lacks those capacities. And so it seems appropriate to say that's an offshoot of me, uh, whereas the, the other product is me. That's the continuation. So we see then how there could be an intermediate state uh, if, if such a fissioning were to happen. You would be uh, existing somewhere prior to the resurrection. Yes. Uh, and then how does resurrection work on Good. that? Good. Yeah, yeah, and so you might say, well, okay, so we continue as embodied beings. It makes the resurrection look anticlimactic, right? Whereas the content of Christian hope, we look forward to the resurrection of the dead. Um, if I'm already already have a body, what what's so special about the general resurrection? That that would be one way of posing the question. Uh, I, I I should say that you know, Christians, not all Christians, have thought there is such a state as an intermediate state between death and the resurrection. Although it's a very widespread view, and there's some reason to think it's so, um, based on, on on our theological sources in the Bible. Um, a few fleeting passages suggest that it is so. Um, and uh, it, it, often the language of soul <coughs> is used to describe, you know, the souls of those um, waiting for the resurrection. But uh, on, uh, and so you might say, well, doesn't the Bible just straightforwardly indicate that uh, we don't have bodies, uh, that we, we are, are just souls? But I, there I think the term soul uh, is, uh, there's reason to think that the biblical authors don't have a particular metaphysical view about what the soul, what constitutes the soul. Right, it's it's a it's it's that aspect of ourselves that is our our our, our psychological and spiritual aspect of ourselves, and I, I think it's an interpretation to say that consists in an immaterial substance that could be so, but I so I, I don't think that there, there's a clear teaching in the Bible one way or the other, um, just because the language is used and that language is traditionally associated with a certain metaphysical picture, so. Uh, so I, I embrace the language of the soul. It's biblical language, uh, and it's what what's at issue is how exactly we should think about that. Um, so yeah. So on my picture, then we because we are essentially embodied, the interim state would have to be an embodied state. Um, but it could be that uh, it's a very impoverished type embodied state. Um, certainly, we're told that uh, by the apostle Paul in the, the, the one extended passage that we have in the Bible about the resurrection um, in his epistle to the Corinthians, that um, uh, he, he, well, first of all, Paul uses the analogy. He says, as a seed is sown into the ground and becomes uh, a living uh, plant, um, so the, our bodies sown into the ground at death uh, rise uh, and become something very different all right, uh, so there's, there's an implied material continuity of some sort, as just because the seed is materially continuous with even a very large tree that subsequently develops out of it, uh, but a, a also a significant discontinuity where, where our bodies are said to be imperishable, indestructible, right? Presumably uh, human uh, persons who are subject to all sorts of grave physical defor uh, deformities or cognitive impairments that are biologically rooted are not going to continue to labor under those, those um, problems in the afterlife. So there's going to be dramatic change. And our bodies are not, as they are now constituted, are subject easily to decay. Um, so there's going to be dramatic change. And so the way I think of the resurrection moving from an interim state is a very rapid process of changeover of possibly of the very particles that constitute our bodies certainly of the environment that we will inhabit um, to make the, the language that Paul uses, um, the, 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 the great truths that Paul um, holds out, holds forth to us that we will one day have imperishable um, bodies to be possible. Um, uh, you know, just as you know, science now contemplates people, artificial sorts of parts that can be grafted in, and integrated within uh, the human body where we, where we have diseased parts of our bodies, um, who knows what the possibilities are for uh, God to, uh, in a way that it involves a continuous process where I continue to 
be, exist and be conscious. Nevertheless, I, uh, my body um, undergoes very rapid change. Uh, and so that, that's how I would think of the resurrection. Now, you might say, well, that doesn't sound like resurrection, but it could, God could speed up those processes. It could, it could take place in an extremely short interval of time, um, and it could be a dramatic change. And so it could be, uh, experientially, it could be as if I'm suddenly something altogether new. Well, you think about uh, the way the resurrection is depicted uh, uh, in Jesus's case, you might yes. think it was a, a rapid transformation yes. of this uh, recently deceased organism into a new kind of uh, uh, organism. So one, one thing that seems at least logically possible, I wonder what you'd have to say about a scenario like this. Uh, so we can certainly imagine that God um, affects a fission of the kind you've described. Um, um, and splits you into two. But likewise, we can imagine God splitting you into many more than two. Uh, what, 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 how, how do you think about a scenario in which uh, God fissions you into five different uh, duplicates? Uh, one gets um, uh, blown to smithereens somehow. Uh, presumably, you don't go uh, with that one. But now, what about the remaining uh, four? Uh, w which of those is you, and how on your picture does that get decided? Yeah. Um, well, I think at the end of the day, um, I am a, there's a primitive fact about being the individual that I am. Uh, and well, let's, let's consider the soul case. Um, of course, souls, they don't have parts. So, so I want to, I, I, I want to make a point that, that, uh, I'll carry over that, that, because I think there's an analogous question that applies to the soul, although it's not obvious. This, the soul doesn't have parts, so the soul can't fission, perhaps. But, um, human, uh, human beings, if, if we are, uh, mental substances, souls, are associated with bodies and interact with our bodies via our brains. And, and our brains, in the natural order of things, sustain our souls in existence on this picture. Now, God might miraculously take over uh, what the brain was doing in sustaining our, our souls at death, but while things are going naturally, our, 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 the functioning of our soul, and indeed it's plausible that the very existence of our soul is sustained by the brain. Now, uh, our brain is composed of two hemispheres along with a brain stem uh, and a band of fibers that connects those hemispheres so that they can communicate. Um, and it's, it, you can sever that band of fibers that connects it. And we could imagine a, a future kind of surgery where the, the hemispheres are completely separated, but both preserved mm -hmm. and um, transplanted into two different bodies. Um, and each of the hemispheres is sufficient for sustaining a soul, indeed a thinking mind. There's a lot of duplication of, of uh, biological mental function in the two hemispheres. Um, our, our two hemispheres are not perfectly symmetrical, but we, we could imagine a scenario where, where they were made to be perfectly sy symmetrical. That, that's just a, a troubling detail, but let's, let's not worry about that. Um, so let's, let's pretend as if it, there, were, there were perfect symmetry. So now how should a, 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 a dualist who um, thinks of human persons as souls think about what would happen in this scenario? There are, there are three possibilities. It could be that me, my soul, goes with let's call him lefty, yeah. the, the left, left individual, uh, or it could be that it goes with righty, or it could be that it goes with neither. Yeah. Um, two new souls come into existence, I go out of existence. Uh, it can't be that I'm both because they're not identical to each other, right? So uh, presumably there's a fact of the matter, right? Um, uh, but it's, it, it would seem from an empirical point of view to be just arbitrary to say, I'm lefty or I'm righty. Both lefty and righty will claim to be me because they'll have continuity of memory and so forth. One of them has just appeared in existence with a lot of false memories about who he or she is, um, but at least one of them. Uh, but it could be, could be the case that, um, in fact, I am one of those individuals. There, there's a fact of the matter. It, it has to be the case that uh, either I'm one of them or I'm none of them. And it's unclear that um, there's anything you could point to about the nature of the bodies, the hemispheres, that would dictate which of those it is. It's just a f an ultimate fact. It, 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 
it's kind of mind-boggling. Uh, it, it seems like it would be a fact that could be known only to God, perhaps. Um, and so I would say similarly, if um, God certainly would have the power to cause the fissioning of my body into uh, multiple bodies, living bodies, um, and he could do it in such a way, and he would know um, which of those individuals would be me, assuming any would, uh, in but there, there would be no way of determining it. It's, so so it's, uh, it's just a brute fact of being me. There's the, my individuality uh, is not something that's reducible to just all the facts about me, right? Um, I am a, a, an, an individual thing. And so uh, I, I, don't know, you know, I don't know how that would go, um, uh, it, it, but I don't think there's anything we could point to empirically that would tip us off to which one was me. But there'd still be a fact of the matter. So some philosophers have used the term uh, thisness. Is, is the idea yes. that there's a, a primitive feature or a constituent of you that makes you you that would go with one of these bodies and not with the others, and it would be by virtue of that thisness, this property or constituent that followed one of these bodies and not the others, that that one is you? That's Yes, I, I think so. I mean, so imagine two identical human individuals uh, not just identical twins, but, but who are created at the same moment with the exact psychological profile, exact same memories, exact same beliefs, um, desires, and, and intensity of desires, exact same intentions, goals, etc. Um, clearly, they'd be two. I've just described the scenario. It's perfectly coherent. There, there are two, but they might be, in terms of their properties that they have, their characteristics, utterly identical, and yet they're different. There's just a brute fact of being this individual and being that individual, and that, that, that brute fact of thisness, you know, being this and being that, um, doesn't, isn't determined by anything about the characteristics of the individuals, their, their nature. It's just a brute fact of individuality. Philosophers sometimes distinguish between uh, different, different problems of evil. So the problem of evil, um, how is it that the existence of all of this suffering we find ourselves confronted with is compatible with the existence of a, an, an all-good, all-powerful, all-knowing God? Uh, if God is all-good, wouldn't he uh, want to prevent uh, uh, so much of this horrific suffering? And if he's all-powerful and all-knowing, wouldn't he have the power and know how to do so? And so why do we find ourselves confronted with all of this suffering? Now, <clears throat> this is a kind of theoretical problem, um, but it's also, there's also an existential problem that we face when we encounter terrible evil in, in our own lives and in the lives of others. It can induce a kind of vertigo, vertigo. it can make it very difficult to believe that, that there is a God of, of the kind described by traditional Christianity. Um, and so you, you've done some really interesting thinking and writing about this, um, this, this existential problem of evil. Um, as it's treated in the writings of uh, Fyodor uh, Dostoevsky uh, and, and um, his um, beautiful character, Father Zosima. And so I wonder if you could tell us a bit about how you think about the practical problem of evil uh, and what you think uh, Dostoevsky's um, uh, solution or reply to this problem is and, and then whether you think it works, whether you, whether you find it persuasive. Yeah. the. Uh, the practical problem is sometimes we, we find ourselves quite rightly um, feeling a revulsion against certain kinds of really horrific evil um, that uh, certainly others in the world experience and maybe we ourselves have been touched by um, at some point in our lives. Uh, and it induces in us a profound sense of that this, things ought not to be this way. And we don't want to align ourselves with any grand scheme of things such that um, uh, this is, is a, a part of what's being planned. But of course, as theists, the problem is God has permitted the, uh, a world uh, for us to exist in a world where precisely such horrible things have happened. And so then the, for some individuals, when they experience this kind of uh, of, of intense suffering, they find themselves just psychologically withdrawing from God. Um, uh, it's, 
it, and it, it's as because perhaps out of an identification with the sufferer, they, they feel they don't want to simply say uh, that, well, God is wholly just and God is perfectly good and he will bring good out of horrific evil. They, they, they worry that this seems to um, say that they should not properly grieve uh, the suffering that, uh, that human individuals experience. I mean, many, many religious individuals sometimes report um, not so much theoretically ceasing to believe that God exists when they encounter evil, but just feel God feeling distant and, the, and feeling the inability to draw near to God and to, to love God, to trust God, um, given his willing per, um, permission of these kinds of suffering. And that's the, the way that Dostoevsky frames the problem of evil in The Brothers Karamazov, which I think is just a, a terrific novel in, in many ways. You have three sons of, of, uh, that um, are all interesting characters, but one of them goes off, it's set in Russia, of course, uh, one of them is, uh, goes off and is educated in the West and becomes a sort of enlightenment uh, atheist type figure, and he, uh, he, th he frames the problem of evil this way. He's, you know, he says, I don't want to, even if it's true that God will bring great good and cause uh, an uh, ultimate harmony of all things uh, in the, the eschaton. I don't want to participate in that. I, you know, and I, 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 I want to declare now, I, I want to have no part of that. And it seems to be a kind of moral righteousness stand of saying, uh, you know, maybe God could cause me to acquiesce in it, but I don't want God to do that. Don't, I don't want him to change my mind about this. I, I want to just stand apart and stand with the suffering victim. He puts so, it in terms of the suffering of a, of a young child and says, yes. if, if all of this requires the torture of this one innocent child, then I don't want a part of it. Yes, exactly. And uh, so then there's this other character that, um, and Dostoevsky very much wrote, uh, he wrote it um, in, in stages. It, it was published in serial form, as many 19th century novels were. And we have some of his correspondence. Um, and he, he very much wanted the, the novel to, to offer a response to the problem of evil. And he feared that he did a better job of framing the problem of evil uh, than, than he did in, in giving a powerful Christian response to it. And, and in fact, in, as, as you know, in uh, a lot of anthologies devoted to the problem of evil, you often get an excerpt of just the, uh, Ivan, the, the, the brother of the atheist, his statement of the problem of evil. And it's, it's very painful to read, his recounting of just some horrific atrocities. Um, that occurred uh, in and around that time. Uh, so, but, th but this character, Father Z uh, Zosima, is a sort of, he's, we're, we're introduced to him as the saintly monk that people come to and they just feel spiritual comfort, often just in his presence, even when he doesn't speak. Uh, he's this, 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 this powerful saintly figure. He's a person of overwhelming love. I mean, that's yes. the thing that most strikes you about him. Right, so uh, really a model of, of, of Christian virtue, uh, a very Christ-like figure. Uh, but uh, he, at one point, he recounts the story of his life and, he, and he, he indicates that actually, early on, he was a violently angry um, young man and uh, participated in dueling. Uh, and such, and uh, over the course of his life, he, he embraced the Christian faith and was slowly transformed. And all the, uh, he functions, I, I, I think, in Dostoevsky's hands as a kind of witness to, because he, 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 he encounters people, people come to him who are suffering horribly. So he, he's not sheltered from, he, he's aware of the intense suffering of many individuals. And he just speaks with great confidence that it is possible to be reconciled to that uh, without diminishing it and, and while still identifying with the victim of suffering. And, and he doesn't tell us how. He just says it is possible to come to see things in this way. So he's, he's, he, he, I, I take it what Dostoevsky is doing, he's saying he's a kind of witness if you get to a point of spiritual development that an individual like Father Zosima um, has, it's possible to have an integration of your deep, profoundest moral convictions about the, the wrongness of horrific suffering and complete trust in the deep love of God. Uh, and so he, and, and, and we're supposed to, the, uh, what we, the reader, 
artists are, are invited to take away is listen to the testimony of some individuals like that. Uh, it's true there aren't that many of us that attain that level of saintliness in, in, our, in our lives, but there are some. And we should, we should listen to them because these are far from being individuals who are morally calloused. They're not dismissive of suffering. These, these are, they have great sensitivity to suffering, and yet they also have profound intimacy with God. And um, they, they can experience it as a moral committedness and um, trust in the love of God. So, so I, I just think uh, uh, he, Dostoevsky's solution is there are certain saints that are witnesses to us that it is possible so, to reconcile that. And, and then it's an invitation for us to try to follow that path and to experience that for ourselves. So is, is it that <clears throat> you, you can imagine someone in the, in the grip of uh, an existential crisis uh, Pulling, finding themselves repulsed maybe by God uh, uh, because of horrific suffering they've experienced or witnessed. And, is, and it, you can imagine trying to come in and give the person an argument, you know, a philosophical argument, yes. which maybe uh, in some cases might help, but in many cases maybe would feel cold and lifeless and uh, um, unduly abstract. And is, is Dostoevsky in effect saying, I'm not going to give you an argument. I'm going to give you a picture. This is, this is what it looks like to be... Um, full of love, wholly trusting in God and His goodness, wholly in solidarity with the suffering. This is what it looks like it can be done. Um, uh, contemplate this and it, it will bring healing to you? I mean, is this in effect the, the Yes, thought? I think that's it. Um, I, I, I think he should perhaps add um, what he no doubt believes, uh, that some human individuals in this life may have experienced such profound suffering. Say, seeing the, uh, he, he recounts a story of uh, a mother seeing her, uh, her child being deliberately killed savagely right before her eyes. It, you know, that, so the people who experience wartime atrocities uh, it can become so psychologically damaged. It may be impossible, uh, absent a miraculous divine intervention in this life for those individuals to experience the kind of peace and wholeness that a character like Father Zosima um, experiences. Um, and, uh, and I think we just have to recognize that. Um, it, th th these individuals may be um, rendered naturally incapable of, of any psychological wholeness, wellness in this life. But um, God is capable of, you know, uh, Jesus is the great physician, and uh, we are promised that um, individuals who cling to God will even if they're not capable of experiencing that, 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 that wholeness, that overcoming of deep woundedness, uh, God can bring that about. And it's, it's hard to imagine sometimes how that could be, but um, I think as Christians, we also have to bear in mind um, that the God we worship is a God who suffered greatly on our behalf. And um, uh, a, a contemporary philosopher, Marilyn Adams, has interestingly um, speculated that one way in which people who've experienced horrific suffering might actually come to, in a way, ha have that suffering take on redemptive value for them, even though it remains an evil thing, what they experience, but it can't come to have redemptive uh, significance if God enables them in a kind of mystical way to yoke their suffering, see their suffering, as a means of identification with the suffering of Christ on our behalf, right? The, the inner life of God who grieves um, over, over his uh, suffering and sinful children and, and longs to have them return to them and, and experience profound suffering and alienation in, in, in um, the second person of the Trinity and incarnated and crucified. Um, that could be, uh, for, for, for some individuals in this life, they might say, well, I, you know, I can't, make that identification, it still, it doesn't help me to, but God could cause them to have insight into the character of God that it could somehow take on redemptive significance for them. And I, I find that a, a helpful suggestion as just, just a, a possible intimation of a way that that, that, that could be done. Um, and no doubt it, would, it requires supernatural activity on the part of God, but we, we're already, we're already committed. committed to that, yeah. Now I can imagine someone saying, well, um, Okay, so maybe there are some Father 
is awesome if others awesome is out there. And good for them. I mean, they, they've been able to attain this state of, of perfect love and solidarity with, with um, the suffering and, 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 and still cognizance of God's good, goodness. But um, most people can't do that. Uh, and now here I'm thinking of Ivan's uh, story of the Grand Inquisitor and uh, the, this, this, this critique of Jesus' program of salvation as being too difficult for the masses, only, only accessible to a few excessively saintly types. And for the rest of us, and for, and for, the, for the majority of us, um, wholly inaccessible. And, and so I can imagine somebody saying to Dostoevsky, uh, okay, I mean, great for Father Zosma, but, but there's so many of us who aren't gonna be able to attain to that. So this isn't really a help um, for, for the most of us. Maybe at best, what you're describing is a, is a way out of the existential uh, problem of evil for a few saintly types, but for the rest of us, no help here. How do you respond? Yes, I do think Dostoevsky was sen sensitive to that, and um, I, I think the, th the thing to say is we clearly live in a, a deeply broken world, um, and uh, we, are, we are given as a kind of gift, I think, really saintly individuals that can really strengthen our hope that uh, the Christian faith is, is real, the kind of transformation that the gospel promises us to us is a real possibility. We experience a bit of it, hopefully, in our own lives, but perhaps not, not, not as profoundly as, as, as some seem to have, have done. Uh, but, um, you know, we're, they, but this life is not um, where, where it all comes together. Um, and so um, what we, we, we have to live in hope uh, that in our redeemed life, we will ultimately come to experience that. It's a mystery why some individuals are allowed to progress much further because they do so by the grace of God. Um, and, and others struggle miserably and just barely cling to their faith and feel like they don't see great deal of progress. They struggle against besetting sins and character flaws that they can't seem to shake. Uh, and th this, is, this is part of the, the world in which God has set us. It's a broken world. And in, in a curious way, it's a witness to the truth of the gospel. It, it teaches us just how deep the problem of sin is. Um, uh, so, and some people are in the unfortunate role of manifesting just how, how badly um, the brokenness can be, how, how ugly it can look, um, both morally and just experientially, effectively. Um, so we have to hope uh, that um, in, in, in our redeemed lives, uh, all of us will eventually come to share. So, so it's true, in a way, the Grand Inquisitor is true that, naturally speaking, given the run of the, the, you know, the range of human personalities and degrees of capacity to, to, to engage in disciplined spiritual, in, uh, you know, to participate uh, in, in God's process of transformation of, of ourselves, in a, in a disciplined, wholehearted way. Um, we, we vary, as we, we, uh, human beings, we vary in every dimension and includes even our, our capacity for, to undertake strenuous um, self-reformation uh, by the grace of God. And uh, that's just a, f a, f a fact. And we have to recognize that and recognize that some individuals are starting at a very different place and they need to measure their progress by where they've come from, not how far along they are along the path of, path of true uh, transformation. So, but the thought is that the, the, the Father Zosimos of the world, the saints, these, they're giving us a picture of w what we can um, uh, uh, hope for in Christ in the long run, uh, perhaps not in this life, uh, but in the life to come. Yes, and, and, the, uh, and one thing I, I, I should add is that what Zosimo is telling us is that he started out, out in a pretty bad place. He was a deeply angry, self-centered, aggressive individual, not at all a saintly individual. And by the grace of God, he ended up in this very, very different place. So it, it holds out hope that it's possible even for those uh, who feel themselves to be the furthest from the, the, the ideal of Christ-like character that the gospel points us to. Yeah. Well, Tim, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks.